Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of At the Table. I get to have today one of my dearest friends that I have been so encouraged and challenged by, Jackie Taylor. I mean, I can't, I can't not love your name, obviously. And so this is getting oh. to be a, <laughs> a meeting of the Jackies. And I might just go ahead and preface that there could be a little bit of attitude and rawness that comes <laughs> from this conversation between you and me. But Jackie, welcome to the show today. <laughs> Thank you. I am so happy to be here. I'm really excited about this. I am so happy to have you on to share your story as well as um, just how I've been able to watch your your leadership journey here over the last few years, but even more kind of the twists and turns that have happened over the last couple of years. So um, as we get into that, why don't you give us kind of like a bird's eye view, um, like a, a high flyby of just who you are, where do you live? Tell us about your family and in ways that you lead. Okay. So Jackie Taylor and I live in Georgia. I live in Douglasville, about 30 minutes outside of Atlanta. Um, I am a northerner, so I'm always very specific to say I live in Georgia. <laughs> I am from Georgia. Shout out to all the Southerners, but I, I make that distinction. Um, but I am a wife of 18, almost 19 years. It'll be 19 in February, which is crazy because clearly I'm too young to have done anything for 19 yes, years. Very young. But um, I have four teenagers that are 18, 17, almost 16, and almost 15. So mm -hmm. that's a whole situation. Yeah. Um, they're all in high school together, which is pretty cool actually to see happen. Uh, and so, like I said, we live in Georgia now, but my husband pastored in Portsmouth, Virginia. So anyone who knows Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach area, pastored there for a decade. So I was a planter's wife for 10 years. Uh, I've been in ministry for 25 years. 27 years yeah. uh, in various capacities. I've served in leading in youth ministry, um, leading out in women's ministry, which is super, super close to my heart. Uh, right now we are a plant, a, excuse me, a part of a new plant in the Georgia Marietta area. And so that's different. Mm -hmm. um, but I serve at the North American Mission Board and I've had the privilege to serve on three teams there. So the first one was my boulevard, which focused on church planters planting in an urban context. So I was able to serve there and lead out in the women's cohorts there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I moved over to spouse development, which was an awesome time. And I was able to serve regionally in the Northeast and the South for all of the sin cities and serve the wives there. And currently I'm a part of the assessment team uh, still at the North American Mission Board. And so I am a regional trainer responsible for the Northeast, Midwest, and Ohio Valley. And um, so that has a different leadership component because now I work with the guys. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's where I am in the ways that I've served. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and as you can see, just, and that's a very high view of all of the things that you have done yeah. and lead. <laughs> I mean, you are such a multi, like you're a great utility player, I think on any team, because you really can step into students and women and leadership development. And now I think even in this new role, being able to really be a big part of bringing up that next generation and forming um, a lot of our leaders as they are being sent to lead and plant and serve in different areas areas and capacities. And so, um, I truly think you are just one of those gals that has like all of the things that I'm like, okay, how, how do I learn under that? You know, and, and tell me what you would do in this situation. And so, um, very much a distinguished and proven leader, um, in a lot of different contexts, a lot of different, um, even, like communities that you've served in, whether it be urban or um, up in the north or down in the south. So, yep. Well, I also kind of giggle at the you're northern, but you're living in Georgia because I feel like yeah. I'm the same way with Texas. Like I am Texan. There is no outside of that. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a thing. It, yeah. it is definitely a thing. It is. It is. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, your cancer journey. So yeah. as we keep in mind, all of the ways that God is leading you to step into new opportunities for leading women, for um, being a part of different systems and processes in leadership development. I mean, God is opening and has been opening all of these doors and then here recently, I mean, there was a big pivot. Um, so why don't you take us back to kind of those moments leading up to your diagnosis? Um, and, yeah. and I think even just 
because we all like in some form or fashion are leading, we are influencing, we are mm-hmm. serving, we are doing all of these things. And so I think one of the things that I want to highlight in today's episode with you is that usually we are doing the good thing. Like we're leading and we're, yeah. we're walking in faithfulness to where God has you. And that doesn't keep us from hard circumstances. It doesn't keep us from dark seasons of life. And so why don't you kind of reel us back a little bit into yeah. what that looked like for you? I, I absolutely will. And I want to say before I say that, Jackie, you just said something that really sparked the thought that we're all leading in some capacity. Mm-hmm. And when you ask, I gave all of the ways that I've served in this church and served in that church and this organization. But I was also a stay at home mom for 12 years. Mm-hmm. And if that was not leading, I don't know what was. Amen. So I do not want to leave. <laughs> I don't want to leave that out for, for one for one moment. That's probably the hardest leadership role there was. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just wanted to, to make mention of that because that does not need to be looked over or left out for anyone's life. Um, but you ask about uh, this most recent cancer journey or my recent cancer journey. So um, I turned 42 in January. And the reason why that's important is because I'm the youngest of three girls and we lost our mom when she was 42 years old. Mm -hmm. So I was already looking at this year, like, come on, 42, let's just get this over with kind of thing. And my older sisters were kind of like, okay, we just get you over the line to 43. Then we're safe kind of, you know, or at least we've all made it, so to speak. And so I turned 42 in January. I honestly started not feeling well in January. Hmm. And I was just like, hmm, this is interesting, but I run pretty hard. In my current um, leadership position, I travel and sometimes I can travel twice a month and I'm gone four days each time I travel. So that can take a toll. So I was just feeling like I'm feeling tired. Um, That was in January, just kind of started feeling a little bit off, but nothing significant. In February, I noticed that um, I was using the restroom quite a bit, um, but not able to um, have complete or have bowel movements, which is strange, but Mm -hmm. I just noticed it like, hmm, that's odd. Um, And my older sister is an OBGYN. So I'm having these conversations with her like, hey, lady, this is going on, that's going on. And she keeps saying, well, you need to go get imaging done. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, okay, fine, whatever. Um, started not feeling so great, a little bit worse. I went to urgent care and I thought that I just had a UTI, you know, us women, we are infamous for give me, uh, I mean, if I give me some ginger ale and a nap and a towel, I'll I'll be good in a day. (laughs) There's stuff to do. There's stuff that has to be done. And so I did go for that. I took the medication. I still wasn't feeling well in between all of this. I'm still traveling for work. So I'm taking the medication, gone for four days, come back. Um, still wasn't feeling well, rested for a couple of days. I went back to urgent care because at this point, the pain had radiated around my back. Mm-hmm. I was like, mm, that's really uncomfortable. They thought perhaps I had pyelonephritis, which is a kidney infection. And so they gave me medication for that, which is very similar to the medication for a UTI. It's still an antibiotic, some medicine okay. for cramping, that kind of thing. Okay. And so I took that medicine. It literally did nothing. I had one more trip that I needed to get through that I felt like I needed to get through, Mm -hmm. um, which was to my last assessment center for that semester, which was of all to Canada. So I'm like, not only was I not feeling well, now I need to take an international trip. (laughs) This seems like a great idea. Let's go. Um, And so I rested for a few days. I went to Canada. When I was in Canada, two friends who I very rarely talk to during the week or outside of special occasions. Both of them FaceTimed me. I was like, this is really weird. One mm-hmm. who lives in Hawaii. And she's like, I thought you said you weren't feeling good. And I'm like, I'm not. And she said to me, don't take this for a joke because my mom had a friend and blah, 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 blah. And by the time she went to the doctor, she found out she had cancer. And I just thought you are being so melodramatic right now. <laughs> this okay. is a, a UTI that's gotten out of control, but you are doing a lot. Like, this is my thought process. Mm-hmm. So I get back. Um, that trip was in March. And so here's where the timeline really, I get back on March the 25th, which is a Friday. My husband is leaving for travel. My husband works for the Billy Graham Association and he was leaving on Monday. He looked at me. I must've looked kind of funny. He said, do you need me to stay home? I said, classic me. I was like, I don't need you here staring at me. I'll be fine. I just (laughs) need to go to sleep for a little while, you know, take the weekend to rest and maybe I'll take Monday off. 
He leaves on Monday. On Tuesday is the 29th. My teenagers leave the house. My routine, I'm like, okay, let's make sure the dog is straight. Not the dog, he wasn't here yet. Let's make sure the house is straight. Kids leave the house. In my mind, I said, I remember thinking, I'm going to lay across the bed for a minute because I do not feel well. Now, leading up to this, I had gotten lab work done that came back completely normal. And so I was like, I'm good. And uh, I just said, I don't feel great. I'm going to lay across, drink some water and lay across the bed. I drank the water and it literally felt like it punched me the entire way down. It was one of the Mm -hmm. most painful things that has ever happened. Mm -hmm. And I laid across the bed and I let out this scream because I was in so much pain. And simultaneously, I started regurgitating water and going to the bathroom on my uncontrollably. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hmm, I should call 911. Like this, I am all yeah. alone at this point. My husband's gone, my kids are at school, and we don't have real community, a lot of community in Georgia. So mm-hmm. I was like, I should call 911, which I did. Go to the hospital. I'm there all day, you know, a trip to the ER. Long story short or shorter, CAT scan. The doctor comes to me and he says, Miss Taylor, I'm going to take my mask off. By this point, it's the evening. This started at about nine o'clock in the morning. He said, I'm going to mm-hmm. take my mask off because I want you to see my face. And I said, OK. So he takes his mask down and he says, do you know what the word gynecological means? And I'm like, yeah. He says, do you know what the word oncologist means? And I said, yes. Um, because as you know, Jackie, my youngest daughter is a cancer survivor. So right. I'm like, I got it. And he says, I need you to see a gynecological oncologist before this week is over. And I said, okay. And the tone and the look on his face told me that we were about to go for a wild ride. So Mm -hmm. nothing but the favor of God. I called on Wednesday morning. They got me in on Thursday. Where does that happen when you call a specialist office that you've never heard of, never been to? They Mm -hmm. got me in on Thursday. I went, um, a girlfriend of mine went with me because my husband was still gone. And um, they showed me on the screen, this mask. And this entire time I'm sending my sister, whatever information I get. And I remember telling my girlfriend, take a screenshot of that. So I can send it to lady when we leave. (laughs) Took a screenshot of it. And with my own eyes that are not medically trained, I could tell that's big. Like Mm -hmm. stuff looks pushed over and that looks big. Mm-hmm. And um, come to find out that I had a mass that was the size of a watermelon. Wow. Um, and what I left out is that in those months that I wasn't feeling well, we're in March now. This started in January, not feeling well. So my abdomen was getting more and more distended. I looked like I was about six months pregnant, actually. But mm-hmm. I was attributing that to the fact that I couldn't have a bowel movement. Um, and so that was um, March the 29th. And then March, so now we're in April, by the time I actually get there, you know, get all the things. And I had surgery on April the 25th. And so on April the 25th, um, I had what was supposed to be a two hour surgery that ended up being five and a half hours Mm -hmm. because there was so much cancer in my body. I had stage four ovarian cancer and I had to have a complete hysterectomy. Uh, Also, I had to have resections, which is cutting of my colon and my rectum because the way that the mass was laying was the reason why I couldn't have a bowel movement. Mm -hmm. It had completely uh, precluded everything from moving and was beginning to eat through both my colon and my rectum. I was inches away from having to have a colostomy bag for the rest of my life. So God was really good, but that was really hard. And that Mm -hmm. began, um, my life for the next eight months, which was uh, chemotherapy and four different types of chemotherapy, followed by staying in the bed for about seven or eight days after each round. Um, Yeah, it was pain like I've never experienced in my life. And I came to understand something that I did not have grace for before, which is when people would say, I I can't, I just can't do it. Mm In my mind, I always thought, what do you mean you can't? You suck it up, buttercup, and you get moving. Left foot, right foot, let's go. There are things to be done. Mm -hmm. And boy, did I learn my lesson about what the difference. So Mm -hmm. that's that's kind of that journey. I rang the bell on uh, September the 22nd. 
So I have begun my road into remission and I still have treatments that I have to do, but that that's where we are now. Okay. Well, and we're going to get into just that wrestling in that last eight months that you've just walked through, but I want to go back, I think, and kind of bring up, and you mentioned it, your daughter is a cancer survivor. Um, And then on top of just parenting four kids and teenage years and, um, and just knowing you, there have been a lot of struggle. There's been a lot of just in your story to where you can look at Job or Joseph, you know, and just be like, goodness, here is such a faithful follower of God. And yet it seems like one thing after the other, after the other kind of comes at you. And so take me back to that doctor taking off his mask and you having to process, okay, this isn't people that I'm fighting for now, you know, this isn't people that I'm shepherding and caring for, but now, all right, God, like, this is, this is me, you know, like this is what is being allowed. So Take me back, I think, to just what was going in your mind in having to wrestle out like this is this is a whole nother level of um, of darkness and suffering that you had to walk through. Absolutely. And so, you know, I'm tempted to give you the hallmark answer, but because it's you, I'm going to give you the real real. answer. (laughs) And so there are two things. Number one, I felt strongly. um as I was praying in the months leading up to, because I just had trepidation, of, like I said, about my birthday in general. I'm a huge mm-hmm. birthday girl, mm-hmm. but that this year was like, oh my gosh. Right. And I felt like something was coming. Mm-hmm. I just felt strongly like something was coming. The phrase that I often use um, for my discernment is there's chum in the waters. You know, if you watch Shark Week on Animal Planet, They chum the waters to get the sharks to come to the surface. But when they put Mm -hmm. the stuff in the water, before you ever see a shark, before you ever see the trouble, the seagulls start swirling. There are other indicators that something is coming so that Mm -hmm. even if you didn't see them put the stuff in the water, if you just came up on a boat, you would know like, wait a minute, something is not as it normally is. And so in my spirit, I really just had this, something is coming. I don't know what it is, but something is coming. Mm-hmm. And so in that moment that that doctor said that to me, I want to say that I had like this big shock and oh my God, but I didn't. I was like, hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the something. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Well, that's a lot, Lord. This is, this is a lot, but this is the something. So I had that feeling, but also the most difficult thing you alluded to it. This is not me showing up for someone else. Mm -hmm. Learning how to show up for myself and allow others to show up for me and trust God for my own life has been the hardest experience to date of my adult life. Mm -hmm. And I have been a Christian since I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, And I found I know how to show up for other people. I mean, you're hard pressed to beat somebody that's going to show up for other people the way that I, because I'm, it's in eight who I am. If you're an Enneagram person, I am a classic two right up until I'm an eight. That's the whole situation, but (laughs) 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 Um, that's that's another podcast, but I showing up for people is natural for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the thought that I was going to have to ask people to show up for me Mm -hmm. and not be, I had no idea just how much I was not going to be able to do. And that was the sobering, what is this going to look like? I'm a planner. And so literally he's talking and I'm like, okay. So I'm almost okay. So if I plan this, so if I get this one, so if I tr- I tried to go into all of the me modes, mm-hmm. you know, right. and right. that doesn't work. That's the opposite of faith. It is self-reliance. And that's really the place that I went into because I've had so much hard in my life. And that's not a woe is me kind of thing. It's just real. Yeah. I I don't go into, oh my God, like that's just not natural for me. That'd be, I'd have to, if I did that, it'd be a performance for someone else. Mm -hmm. I go into, let me figure this out. Let me figure that out. Let me figure this out. But that is sin because of Mm self-reliance. So that's really where I was in that moment. Moments to follow. I had different revelations. 
But in that moment, that's where I was. How can I fix this? What can I do to mitigate the reverberating effects of this on my family, on the people who I lead, on the people who I serve with? Um, That's really the first place that I went. Yeah. And I think you're really kind of bringing up something that as leaders, honestly, and even more so coming out of COVID and like such hard seasons, I mean, that's what we have to do, right? So like there is a crisis, there is a pivot point. And so we're the ones that are having to have the faith to charge everyone forward. We're the ones that are filling the gap for people. And so I was listening to a podcast um, a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about how for especially ministry leaders, because so much of our leadership is from a giving service oriented Mm -hmm. type sacrifice that when it comes to actually having to step back and be served and to have need and to admit need, like, we don't know what to do. We don't even know Mm -hmm. where to start that conversation. And I think what I'm hearing from you is like, you were forced into that. Like there was no, there was no option, you know, there was no option at all. Yeah. So talk me with, uh, well, yeah, I think I want to know, like, when you look back on the last eight months, and I know that you're still journeying this story out, like it is not complete, but when you're looking back on being sick from chemo and in bed, and even in your words, those moments of, I can't like what, what brought you through and what have you learned? I think on the other side of seeing the beauty of need and seeing God's provision and care for you in a way that you've never experienced before. Like, how would you describe that to those of us that are maybe like, yeah, I can't do that. Like I, I've, I've just yeah. got to pull up the bootstraps. Like what would your yeah. encouragement to us be? Um, so I remember one day I was in the bed and um, I was, in the fetal position and I was trying to get out of the fetal position and my hips were locked and Mm -hmm. I I couldn't, I just couldn't move. And I called my son who is a jokester. And so he hits the door and he's like, yeah, girl, what you need? And I was like, babe, I need you to just move mommy's legs because I can't pull them down. Mm -hmm. And so he comes, I have two sons, one is 17, one is 14 and one is six, three and the baby is six, four. So they're big boys. Yeah. And so I was like, get your brother and you guys help me just kind of turn. It was a two person effort because you couldn't just turn me because everything would hurt. So I'm mm-hmm. like, get your brother. And I need you guys to help me turn over. And I need you guys to just pull my legs down. That was probably the most like, I cannot believe this is my life kind of moment. Mm -hmm. And there were two things that I thought, God, when I come out of this, I want people to know these things. Number one, that God, when the word says that God will do anything to get his glory, will use any circumstance, any really does mean any. And so instead of going into woe is me mode, I started asking the Lord, God, how are you going to get the biggest glory out of this circumstance? Mm -hmm. And God, could you, uh, not all of my children are believers. And I said, God, could you, would you please use this and how I journey through this as the thing that they can reflect on and say, you know what? I watched my mom walk through this and I watched her say, I heard her say, God's going to bring me through this. And he was faithful to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the Uh, horns of the altar, so to speak, that I held on to as I walked over the last eight months. And the other thing was back to that day with the boys. I was praying as I was laying there and I was just crying. And I'm not, don't hear me to say that every day laying in the bed in this cancer journey was full of praying and travailing because it was not. There were more days of Lord, you know, my heart, I'm with you. That's the best I got today. Mm -hmm. But this particular day I was praying and I tell you, I, I felt in my heart, man, suffering is so holy. Mm-hmm. I began to think about Jesus in the garden. And when he said, Jackie translation, daddy, I'll do this. But if there's another way that this mm-hmm. can happen, I would really rather that. Mm-hmm. But if there's not, I'll do this. Mm-hmm. In that moment, I felt the holiness of suffering. 
there is something about being at the end of yourself. Like we say that, we sing songs about being at the end of ourselves, but very few or very rarely do we actually come to the end of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And there's something so holy about being in that place when the only thing you can do is call on the name of Jesus. Yeah. And you don't have to be laying in a bed with a terminal disease to get to that place, but it's a holy place when your children are going through and there's nothing you can do about it, which ironically I've been to the end of myself in that, in that way also, but there is a holiness in that suffering that you would think that suffering and pain would take you so far away from the Lord, but almost like a boomerang. If you let it, it can bring you right back. Yeah. And I really do think that that is the most important part of the last eight months. Mm-hmm. So would you say, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, actually. So I'm, I'm going to ask this and then let you, okay. um, cause I'm curious to hear, I think what your answer is, but now um, even more than the eight months, you know, so mm-hmm. diagnosis to today and still yes. having to fight for that joy, yes. still having to yes. fight for that perspective. What would you say is the biggest difference in you after having walked through all of that? Uh, the biggest difference in me is that I recognize that I am not the answer. Mm-hmm. And I recognize that I have walked the majority of my life in self-reliance and not opposition to God, but limiting my thought with a limited thought process of how the Lord would show up for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that that happened as a result of hard after hard after hard after hard, which did not stop when I came to know Jesus. It would just continue to be hard after hard after hard after hard. And so somewhere life taught me, you got to do it. The only person you're going to really be able to trust to get the job done is you. Yeah, you can delegate. Yes, you can ask for the lightweight things, but you've Mm got to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest difference in me is that I realized that I'm not the answer. Mm -hmm. And that if there are things around me that I feel like need to get done, have to get done, 50% 50% of it doesn't. And the world's not going to stop revolving if it doesn't yeah. get done. Because when you're laying in a bed and you see dirty stuff on the floor, the floor needs to be swept, cups need to be, but then, and you can't do it. And mm-hmm. you're like, oh, I, I went to sleep and woke up another day. The world did not stop revolving because mm-hmm. I wasn't able to get the, these things done. So those, I would say, are the two biggest changes in me. Yeah. yeah. And that's a word. And I think even some of our listeners right now are like, yeah, I'm not picking up those socks now, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> leave them until tomorrow. <laughs> but I think it's such a good reminder for those of us that have not walked through not only your cancer journey, but I mean, really Jackie, you have had so many hills and valleys and, and deep valleys. And so to have seen God's faithfulness and sustaining, and, um, I've been reading through the Psalms, you know, in my quiet time, and there's so many Psalms that talk about his strength and him strengthening us. And so yes. that comes from a place of us not having strength, the weakness. And I don't know that in leadership conversations, we're really talking a lot about like, all right, go be weak, you know, like go, yeah. go need, go, um, don't figure figure it out. Don't fix, you know, and like sit in what God can do and, and believe and dream in that God wants to not only do big things in the people that we're leading, but he absolutely wants to do big things in our lives as we trust him. And as he, he journeys with us. So I appreciate that reminder. So, so much for us. I'm wondering as we kind of wrap up, I'm thinking of our listeners. I'm thinking of maybe even um, women that are listening right now and they're like, oh my goodness, my sister needs to hear this, you know, or my um, mom. And so they're going to send this off. And so I'm wondering, and I know this is putting you on the spot, but would you mind praying? I think just for all of those that are listening right now that are maybe in that wrestle and in that dark season and feeling like they want to quit, feeling like they're not going to make it or God isn't who he says he is. And would you just pray for them for that strength, for that 
ability to, I think, lean in even in their weakness. I would love to. Uh, Father, you are amazing. And God, in the most storm-ridden times of our lives, when it's so dark and we can't see our way, you're still there. Mm -hmm. God, would you help us to not just sing it in a song, not just believe it for someone else, but to believe it for ourselves? God, and when we are in the seasons of life or when those around us are in a season of life that it seems that all hope is gone, would you help us to remember what it must have felt like to your mother, Jesus, when she saw you on that cross, when she felt hopeless and helpless to do anything for this child who she bore and loved and was unsure about what was coming next and all she could do was believe. Father, there's a song that says, we have no other choice but to trust you. It's all I can do. I have no other choice but to believe. God, help us to believe you. And Father, in real and tangible ways, I pray for my sisters who are in dark times. I pray, God, that you would help them, strengthen them to ask for the help that they need, even those that it's not their nature. God, would it come bubbling up and out of them in ways that they're like, I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I just asked for that. Mm -hmm. God, from the tangible needs like, hey, I need paper towels or I need baby wipes because I can't get up and I need to be able to wipe, wash my hands or things of that nature to bigger things like I really need meals for my family or I could really use someone to come and just clean my house. I could use someone to come and just sit with me so I'm not by myself during the day. Father, would you help them to see that nothing is too big or nothing is too small? And God, the people who love them, the people who desire to serve them but don't know where to start, Holy Spirit, would you lead them into truth in that area? And the things that they come up with that they think, mm, that's strange, take this, that, that's, that's strange. Ask her what her favorite cereal is or what her favorite snack is or what her favorite book is. Or God, would they follow through on those things because they mean so much. Mm-hmm. Father, I thank you that so much of this Christian walk is togetherness and community. God, in this time, in dark times, would you help us who are not in dark times not to just pull back and say, oh, well, I'll be praying. Mm -hmm. God, prayer is wonderful. But God, we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus as well. And would you help those women who are walking through dark times not to give the classic, oh, I'm good answer, but that they would be transparent and authentic with their need. Father, we thank you that you are faithful in all things and through all things. And ultimately, we want you to get the glory. God, I have learned that sometimes that's going to be in the hardest time of our lives. But Father, help us to hold desperately on to you and believe and hope against hope when everything looks lost, that you have not left us that you've not forsaken us and that you've not forgotten about us. Thank you for it now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, sister. I appreciate you um, spending some time at the table with me today and sharing your story and sharing God's faithfulness and strength and courage and the grit and grace. We didn't even get to um, your your cool (laughs) tattoo, um, but just how he has sustained you and how he is taking, um, I think it's first Corinthians to the first or second Corinthians where you have been comforted by the spirit. And now you are using that in a way to comfort others. And so thank you for being a bomb to so many listeners today. Well, thank you for inviting me to the table. I truly appreciate it. Yes, we love you. And ladies, I know that it's been such a sweet, um, challenging, I think, encouraging time hearing from Jackie. And so we will make sure to um, put in the show notes ways that you can connect with her and even reach out to her and tell her, thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for your encouragement. And, um, And then I hope you'll join us next week for another episode of At the Table. We'll see you then.